Good morning. Nice to Hello. see you. Welcome. Uh, it's a very good picture. Nice, uh, nice sound. So uh, welcome. You, you should and be able to hear me now. Yes. I can hear you. Yeah, great. We like, we like your tie. A very nice yeah. parrot you've got behind you too. Good, mo yeah. what? good morning, Rob. There's a parrot good on your shoulder. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, parrots. So yeah, you have lots of parrots there. Right here. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, good morning, Robert. It's John. So, um, so I've known Robert Hi. for thirty yeah. years. Um, we've aged together, as you can see from our pictures. His uh, taste yeah. in shirts hasn't really improved much over that time, but uh, that's a typical Frenchman. Uh, but he's not going to get away with it's anything today. Here. We're gonna... It's sunny time, spring, we're gonna... so we need to put some uh, some sun there. Right. So we're going to give you a hard time, Robert. So uh, we're ready for you when you want to start your uh, demonstration. Do you want to start the video, uh, Robert? Well, yes, I think you can. Yeah. Yeah. OK, if you're ready. You can narrow it. I am. It's, okay. I'm there ready. It is. it is on. Should change the spotlight view in Zoom, please. Should should I, should be able to see the the video myself or? Chris, change the spotlight view. I can, but I. So, okay, we got it. Anyway, we got it. We got it. We got it. So I'm doing we a transcanal approach for primary surgery, and well, I'm just starting by the approach itself to, to show the mini mini invasive surgery which is the same as for endoscopic approach, by the way. So I do the uh, incision from 6 to 12 o'clock, elevating um, mainly the posterior part of the flap until I reach this uh, annulus that you can see and elevating the annulus there over the corded tympani. So that's the left here. Uh, the point for me is to expose the facial nerve and the uh, uh, pyramidal process of the status tenor. So I, I use this correct. To do the bony room resection, for me, the most important thing is the uh, um, exposure, like this. So I need to see the facial nerve on the left and the brandal process on the right. Starting with the incurious separate joint separation, then checking the malleus incurious mobility, and then the stapes from the top of the head of a stapes. And then I'm using another luminous CO2 autolase system. So I do a laser stapedotomy, which is the mix of uh, mix, uh, of a micro drill. So I'm vaporizing the posterior cruise and the anterior cruise. This is the autolase, which is a CO2 laser with handheld probe. And you see that I'm using the laser just to decrease the thickness of the superstructure. I'm not using the laser to cut completely the superstructure. This helps me to uh, drill out the superstructure and I'm drilling, drilling out the anterior cruise it's always trying to decrease the trauma to the ossicular mm -hmm. chain by using the, the laser. And now I get a, a nice exposure of the foot plate, so I'm gonna start the process. Uh, you see only one or two shots are enough to perform the with this beautiful autolas. I'm using now the, this Lumini system since a few months and I'm very happy with this. This is very safe in fact, because we combine the safety of the CO2 plus, which is totally absorbed by perinemph, plus the safety of a handheld probe. So you see only one shot, maximum two, and then finalizing the state dolomy with a macro drill, which is a 0.7 millimeter burr. And then I'm using, of course, the vein grab. I think we have time to discuss this point. Introducing the vein over uh, the state dolomy with the suction tube on my left hand. You notice that I'm using both hands free all the times. And then I'm cutting out this uh, cross Teflon piston. I'm still using a basic one, a 0.4 millimeter diameter, breaking the memory of the, of the loop, and then introducing the shaft first with the sucker. I'm using at that point a 0.9 millimeter diameter sucker, and then placing the loop around the incus. And then the last step will be to crimp the loop around the incus to ensure precise stability. So I'm using two hooks, you can use a curve forceps, different types of uh, a way of, of using that. Uh, the point is that there's a memory, but it's important not to believe too much in the memory, to crimp up the, to crimp the, the loop like this, and looking for the bending sign, the piston should bend but not move, and then checking the final uh, mobility. So that's, that's the basic technique I'm using. Just a few points about the vein graft now. I take the vein at the beginning of the operation from the dorsal face of the hand. Small incision, very small. So then I'm gonna use only one stitch to, uh, to stitch the, the skin. 
So I like to use a, a vein because I like the fact that the vein is very thin and very elastic. So we got the lateral side of the vein, which is the sticky side, connective face of the vein, and then the, I mean, the adventitial side, and the inside is the, uh, the intima. So I'm now I'm going to pre-shape the vein like this, removing uh, the pre-venous connective tissues from the lateral side of the vein to make the vein uh, thinner. And then uh, I'm going to cut the vein. I'm not going to use the entire vein, but just part of this. And you see now I'm facing the intima of the vein, and there's a hole on the glass plate like this. So I'm going to push the vein down into the hole. So they are still facing now the intima. The sticky side is down to the glass plate, like this. Now, let's go to some words about the patient positioning for transcanal approach. You see the nurse is in front of me, and the patient is strictly perpendicular to me. And I'm using, that's important, a speculum holder to give both hands free like this. And this is kind of a platform. There's a plate underneath the head of the patient and uh, the two joints to fix the speculum. And this will stabilize, of course, the speculum in a nice way. Now, if we talk about the complication, that was the basic stage of surgery. So now, now we can say a few words about the difficult uh, complication about the surgery. The first one is a case of obliterative uh, of the like this. You can see a huge uh, focus. So you see I'm drilling out in a different way. I'm not performing a straightforward state dolomy. I just uh, use the diamond dust burr by itself, just leaving the burr doing the job without any pressure. But I'm enlarging. Uh, you see the drilling out. I mean, it's important not to drill out uh, strictly perpendicular. I, I'm just enlarging the field just to decrease the thickness of the full plate until I reach the blue line, which is the perilymphatic membrane, and then finalizing the state epidolomy. The other point is that I'm measuring at the end to be sure that I will measure at the right neck. Otherwise, there is the thickness of the full plate at the beginning, so we need to take this into account. Now, the case of a decent facial nerve like this. In this case, there is a very small gap, but uh, once we remove the superstructure, we will get a better gap. So you see the facial nerve is completely uncovered by bone. So I will remove first the, the superstructure. In that case, of course, having a laser with a handed probe rather than micro manipulating is, is really a very nice tool. And after having removed the superstructure, I will drill out the promontory strictly perpendicular to the promontory. That's important to make it like this until I enlarge the approach to be able to have a nice view of the full plate. And then you can see that I can perform safety, uh, safely uh, a state dog. Then, of course, this will be followed by the same step, the bank graph into position. In that case, I will use the bucket prosthesis because the increase was short. I will talk about this prosthesis a little bit later, but usually I use this one. I'm not going to attach the loop around the increase, but we can see there's a hollow head and then I will cut the prosthesis in the same way because this is made in Teflon. Again, it's a 0.4 millimeter Teflon prosthesis. I'm going to introduce this prosthesis with the sucker, like this. And this will be placed underneath the lenticular process, so I'll be, I'll be away from the facial nerve compared to the loop of the piston. So I'm introducing now the shaft in the same way. And then I will uh, slightly elevate the incus um, pull the increase a little bit and uh, very gently but first I need to place the, the entire part of the of the, of the procedure that in front of the lenticular process like this and then just put the uh, hollow head underneath the lenticular process and then I will put this uh, wire loop over the incus to try to increase prosthesis stability I mean long term and then again always looking for the bending sign the piston or prosthesis should bend like this but not move away from the other window now, this is a nice precision case of uh, short incus or uh, decent patient nerve. The other possibility, which is pretty rare in my experience, less than 1%, is the simultaneous malleus ankylosis. So you see that in this case, I'm uh, checking uh, ossicular chain stability, separating the joint, and you see now we've got a strong malleus epitopanic fixation plus stapes fixation. So it's a simultaneous malleus ankylosis here. So, of course, I will perform a malleus to stapedolomy procedure, 
But first, I will uh, start dissecting the malice. You know that I'm using this malice relocation technique in order to decrease the huge gap that we have. We do really anterior malice here, so we'll decrease the angle. So we need to do a, a periosteal flap like this, separating entirely the malice from the uh, tympanic membrane, and then removing the incus. I do that only after having separated the malice from the tympanic membrane. Then we need to overstretch the anterior tympanomandibular ligament using a strong hook like this, close to the neck, and pulling the malleus posterior until I overstretch the anterior uh, ligament. There we go. And now you see I'm just placing the malleus over the stapes foot plate, and I can now measure, sticking back the malleus to the tympanic membrane, and again measure using an elongated stapes measuring rod the distance from that is to stay with full plate. And then, of course, I'm going to use the stapedotomy like this with the vein graph interposition, which is, I think, really mandat mandatory when we are using a torque. So this is the type of prosthesis I made with Grace Medical with a 0.4 millimeter diameter shaft, Teflon shaft, and hydroxylaptite head. And you see the position of the groove, which is central at the, the middle of the, of, of the prosthesis head. I'm going to cut the shaft very easily because this is made in Teflon again. So I'm going to cut at the corresponding length, which is usually around 6 to 6.5 in my experience for torque, compared to 4.5 for the incus to state epidotomy procedure. So this is, um, by the way, 6.5. And I'm introducing now the shaft first within the state epidotomy in the same way, placing the malice in front of uh, the stape is there, and then introducing the malleus sandal nicely underneath. I put the, the process underneath the malleus sandal like this, and then they are connected together. And this is a vertical final position of the process. You can see a round window sign in a second on the right to be sure that the process is on the right position. And now finally, I just wanted to talk about the perilymphatic gusher. This is not exactly a gusher, this is a high pressure but not the real gusher, which is much more important than, like, than this, but I'm using a specific technique of, um, uh, of the vein graft plus gel foam to hold the vein down into the other window, because when, when you have a gusher, it's pushing away the, 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 the vein, and we have a floating vein. So the point is that to try to maintain like this by uh, filling completely the other window with gel foam. So that, that's, that's fine. That was a kind of overview of my techniques just to start the discussion now with the panel of, uh, and I guess, uh, John, you're going to start now with a discussion with the panel. Sorry, John. Hold on. You need some sound, John. So I just say hello to my friend from Japan. That was fantastic. Said, uh, and all my friends. Uh, Rob Briggs from Australia, it's nice, and I was a little yeah. bit late to say, and Dwayne, I can see Dwayne, and Michael, every, and Ravi. So nice to see, to see you. So, Beautiful presentation. So great. Uh, Hi, Ravi. Thank you, thank you. So that was a, John, that was a just great... A, over... John, can I just have a quick word yeah. to those delegates sure. who are uh, on sure. the Zoom? Uh, because they're, currently a lot of people are emailing and saying they're not, they don't see full screen. What they need to do is go yeah. on to gallery view in Zoom, right click on the image and then click on spotlight video and that will make it full screen it's no. full screen here <laughs> it was full Cre screen here. yeah okay. but chris it's not spotlight it's speaker view sorry spotlight is speaker only what view. you see yeah speaker view speaker okay view. speaker view speaker. go to speaker view sorry speaker view. Yeah. Okay. okay all right john okay take so it away. Well, robert that was a, a great presentation i had a stopwatch against it and then yeah you are fractionally faster than me so that's uh, deflated me slightly um we don't want to sort of completely concentrate on the technique that, that you favour and I happen to use, but rather look at it in, in, in wider terms. And I thought we might start off by, um, we know that there's some younger members of the audience who are perhaps just starting off in their career with stapy surgery. Um, and we might talk about the approach. There will be some polling questions in a minute coming through from uh, Meanish and Dwayne to the audience. but. Um, you and I use a trans-canal approach, and we're very happy with it. Um, I'd just like to know whether the other members of the panel are, or whether they feel that a, perhaps an end or releasing incision is better in their hands. Perhaps we could discuss that first. Michael, what's the, uh, what's the situation in Hong Kong? 
um, as we we use uh, both um, a canal release incision, which is not really an an oil. It's, it's a very small, so human A and less than the human A incision. So um, in the past, so now um, because I, I, I we we do have more tortures and narrow um, canals in Chinese. I'm not sure the Japanese are the same. So um, a lot of um, our colleagues in back in Beijing, they actually use uh, post auricular approaches, which I've never done it. But um, when we are running courses in China, I, I see them using post auricular incisions. So um, I've actually changed uh, to endoscopic assistant techniques now. So, um, but um, we all know that the side you also remember that this is a one hand surgery, so we need a bit of adaptation and preparation. Um, but it does save the canal release incision so for right. for our patients after Excellent. changing to endoscopic approach and what about you ravi what what's the situation in your uh, in your practice you switch your microphone on ravi your microphone's off yes uh, okay now yes we hear you fine yeah, so in, in my practice, it's almost always a trans canal approach. I don't use uh, a speculum holder, but I can, uh, I've learned to use both my hands with the speculum without the holder. In it. I don't use a releasing incision except for the very, very rare, very narrow canal. So 99% is a trans canal approach. And it is mostly under local anesthesia. I should add that as well. So it's under local anesthesia. Everything else remains almost the same. Keeps everything dry. So perhaps if we uh, perhaps we ask Rob what the situation is down upside down. Well, in my hands, it's very similar to Ravi. I use a transcanal approach with a speculum holder, local anesthesia with sedation, and so the patient's not deeply sedated. They're they're uh, awake enough that I can talk to them, particularly by the end of the procedure. Um, Unlike, I think, some sedation procedures, there it's v virtually a general anaesthetic without uh, uh, without control of the airway. So, uh, relatively light sedation and local anaesthesia. And which approach? You, you right down the car. And Trans, uh, station, trans canal approach. Uh, trans canal. Be very rare so that I do an end oral incision. Yeah, and uh, finally, Seiji uh, Kakiata, what, what, what's your opinion? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi. I'm using the transcanal approach. Uh, like uh, Michael said, I use endoscopic, uh, I use endoscopy to perform a transcanal approach. And I use fish, fish reversal procedure because it allows us to perform one handed surgery and uh, general anesthesia. Okay, so uh, that, that's quite interesting. I went back and looked at um, my series, it's often much smaller than Robert's, but in uh, 1,460 cases, uh, I did one releasing incision. And I know that Robert is, is very similar. And Chris has some figures on this. I think Chris feels that down to about three, 3.5 millimeters, if you have a canal that size, you can manage. So let's imagine we've got down the canal now and we've reflected the tympanic membrane. Perhaps we can ask Robert what landmarks he'd like to see before commencing the formal dissection. Well, as I said, I just want to have a clear exposure of the two main landmarks for me, which are the fascia nerve and the uh, preliminary process of the stapes tendon. So I will uh, do a bony rim resection with a caret, sometime with a chisels, in order to expose uh, those both uh, those two uh, landmarks. I show that on the revision stapes operation when I revised some cases where the previous surgeon didn't do a clear exposure and that was the main cause of failure because the position of the procedure was not good in one point and on the other hand there was also a, um, a short process or so so I think these two landmarks are important for me. And obviously I mean the resection is quite important. How much of the long process of the incus do you think you should uncover? when you're performing uh, the bony rim resection? 
Yeah, that's important not to overexpose, of course, the uh, the incus. Otherwise, there's a risk of retraction of the tympanic membrane. So I would say uh, just be moving until you can see the facial nerve. That's enough. And it usually is something like only one third of the distal tip of the incus is in the majority of cases. Okay, so we looked at, after that, you moved on to actually performing the uh, the dissection proper. Um, we didn't really discuss much about the corda tympani. Um, interesting, the corda tympani. I, I feel terrible here that I have colleagues who say they've never damaged one. And I have to be honest, if I look at my figures, I probably uh, stretch or damage somewhere between 15 and 30%. I don't cut that many. Um, but how do you deal with a corda? I mean, the damn thing always gets in the way. What, what, what do you do? Let's ask the panel. Uh, let's start with Ravi. What do you do with that tricky corda that keeps flopping over the field of view? Yeah, I think I would agree with your numbers that whatever we say, a significant number of cordas do get uh, damaged, injured, stretched, whatever you'd like to say. What uh, I would do is I would try not to touch the corda as far as possible. My initially curating will happen without even touching the corda. And the one trick I've learned is to try to release the corda from where it enters the posterior canal wall. I use a sharp right angle pick and try to break that little bit of bone and try to shift the insertion of the corda into the posterior canal wall a little further down. That way I'm able to see the pyramid better. Uh, but then sometimes the angulation is just impossible and you will end up stretching it and sometimes cutting it. So that is a problem. But most of the time I get away without uh, damage to the corda. Yeah. This is a great trick that you're mentioning here, putting a strong hook into the corda canal. I know Robert favours that and I do and, uh, and Chris does it as well. Um, what's the situation uh, um, uh, in uh, Japan? What do you do with the corda? Um, if it's just falling okay. across you all the time. I suppose if you're doing endoscopically, maybe it's not so much of a problem. Yes, uh, for us Japanese, haste is very, very important for my QOL, quality of life. So I tried to not stretch the corda tympani as much, as less as possible. So I tried to move corda upward or downward, uh, depending on the situation. So anyway, I try to keep or preserve Kordokimpanai as much as possible. And the endoscopy uh, helps uh, maybe much better than microscope maybe. Okay, so let's move on a bit further in. We've, we've, we've sort of got a good view now of our stapes, which Robert showed uh, brilliantly. And we're coming now to the, uh, the nitty-gritty, to the important bit, to deciding whether the patient's actually got otosclerosis and uh, the joint separation. Now, who tests the, uh, the mobility of the acicular chain before joint separation? I All certainly do, John. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the first thing in terms of confirming the diagnosis it's nice to be able to see that there is a anterior focus of color change on the promontory and you can usually see that there is an anterior focus and then i also like to uh, palpate the undersurface of the malleus and see some differential movement at the incubus to pedial joint yeah. yeah of course the other thing that that tells you is it shows you where the joint is because it's a synovial joint it sucks Correct. in slightly and of course, the joint is never quite where you think it is. But quite often what we see is we see re revisions coming of the, this patient may or may not have otosclerosis. My senior resident opened the ear and couldn't decide. And I think that's probably because they didn't separate the incostopedial joint. So I assume that all of us on the panel then separate the joint and then repalpate. Is that a, a, a general agreement? Agreed. Correct. Okay, so what about uh, what about what about um, fixation in the attic? I mean, Robert said a very small percentage, and I'd agree with that. But you know, we have very very uh, experienced AP surgeons in the in the world. You know, Hugo Fish, who says that the, the fixation is much greater than that. I, I find that difficult to believe, but I don't know what you you feel in your particular countries. Uh, in Australia, it's more like your experience. 
we certainly don't see what uh, has been reported from uh, Zurich. Yeah. So you're talking maybe one or two percent? Oh, certainly no more than that. Yeah. 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 What about Ravi? What, what, what about in, in India? What's the situation there? No, in, I think in general, I would agree that the number of uh, fixation of the malleus and infus is a very small number. One to two percent is a good number, I guess. But I was trying to make yeah. a point that once you dislocate the inchiostipedial joint, then when you palpate the malleus in the infus, you get a good idea about the mobility of those two ossicles. And that's Absolutely. something that I would rather do. Yes. You won't do it Absolutely. before before the intercepital joint is not uh, dislocated, then you can't really make out that movement. But after you do that, you tend to know how easily mobile the other two are. Is so one how point, about uh, you go? Yeah, yep. just go ahead, Robert. When I, when I published my result, I published the incidence of uh, malice onkylosis with uh, the first series I published several years ago, 3,000 cases on primary. I got an incidence of 0.7%. And I just remind you that the, the, it's technically, I mean, specifically this malice ankylosis is a congenital malformation related to a very small epitympanic space. This has been reported with uh, temporal bone dissection. And it, th th there's a guy, I forgot his name now, who made a lot of dissection of temporal bone. And he never found, in, in case of uh, something like 200 cases of malice uh, epitympanic fixation, and he, he never found any ligament fixation, just as uh, uh, Hugo Fisch reported. He found all the time that it was related to a very small gap between the malus head and the epitympanic pole. So it's definitely uh, very rare. Okay, so you can see we're sort of working our way down now, uh, getting a bit closer to the, the stapes itself. We've separated the incostopedial joint. Um, we really need to talk about, you know, whether it's really necessary to have these high fluted lasers. You know, who of the panel believes that it's essential to have a laser for primary otosclerotic surgery? I believe that it's essential. <laughs> yeah, I think for it's primary it's, surgery. It's, 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 it's not always essential, but of course it's better to have it. But that specifically when you have a narrow gap or disinfection nerve, there's so many diff different anatomical conditions in which the laser would be really important. But we also need to define what type of laser, because some are more safer, uh, that some are safer than the others, and also micro manipulator or endel probe. There's so many different types. Right. You use a, uh, you, you and I and Chris use a, a flexible fiber optic uh, and uh, to probe effectively, Robert. And you know we found those very successful. But you know I do know some of our colleagues like a, sing, a single shot with a micro manipulator. Does anybody on the panel use a single shot, or, or, or are you all using fiber? Well, just one before with this new system of uh, Luminis with a handle probe you can make it close to a single shot. But the problem with a single shot is that you have to increase the, the setting. Uh, and I think it's pr pretty, uh, sounds to me a little bit ex uh, traumatic, traumatic for the, the, la the laser light, cannon. Light. Yes, yes. I, I mean, I think the, the important thing as well is if you're using single shot with a micro manipulator without, um, without a fiber is collimation is absolutely vital. We've seen before in the past, um, <clears throat> The focusing beam in one position and the laser going in a different direction. I have um, two facial weaknesses in my series, um, both back in the very early 1990s, both of which got better, uh, but they were both associated, I suspect, with, with heating by the laser. Has, have any of the panels seen uh, any facial nerve effect from using the laser? Fortunately, I have not seen it myself, but I do know of it happening. And I think it is definitely related to um, excessive power. Uh, and so you have to be sure about the power settings when you're using the laser and uh, be absolutely sure that it is not directed at the facial nerve. So is there anybody on the panel who, who doesn't use the laser routinely for primary otosclerosis because you know we are talking about quite an expensive uh, quite an expensive fiber here and healthcare economics whether we like it or not do come into it uh, John I, I don't use it routinely so 
Uh, I right. don't use it routinely in primary surgery. I have the laser, the carbon dioxide, with a micro manipulator. It's not the single shot one. So I would like to use it for adhesions in revision surgery or in that uh, difficult situation when I have a floating foot plate. So that's primarily my indication for uh, a laser, but almost never do I have to use it in primary surgery. Yeah. I mean, hopefully we're going to be covering that in the revision session in uh, in a couple of hours' time. Seiji, you, you want to ask a, or make a point? Uh, I've never used laser. I, I use hand drill only. Hand drill. Okay. Well, I think you know, what we what, what we tend to do with the laser is we tend to turn the turn the bone into charcoal and then use the drill almost as a fan to get rid of that charcoal. So we're down to the, uh, we've removed the stapy superstructure now. You saw Robert uh, doing that very nicely. Uh, and we're down to the stapedotomy. Um, we've created the stapedotomy. Let's talk about stapedotomy size. Uh, so let's go round, round the robin of all of you. What size stapedotomy do you perform in turn? Starting with 0 0.7, 0 0.7 millimeters and then a 0 0.6 millimeter prosthesis. Okay. Seiji? Uh, 0 0.6. I use a 0 0.6 hundred rail. Then it, may, it can make a 0 0.7 or a 0 0.8 hole. And then I use 0 0.6 uh, okay. prosthesis. What about Michael? Michael Tong? Uh, I, yes, I use a uh, uh, fiber laser. I use uh, weak energy, make a rosette and uh, uh, micro drill, 0 0.6 and a 0 0.6 piston. Okay, well, we seem to sort of um, be pretty much agreed there that we're performing a relatively uh, small stapedotomy. Sorry, carry on, carry on. Ravi? Yeah, I, I would probably go for something smaller. So my uh, smaller. drill, micro drill, the ski tear, is about 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 uh, millimeter. And I would almost try to use a 0 0.4 millimeter piston throughout. The idea being okay. that the wider the uh, stepidotomy, the more chances that you might uh, breach on the annular ligament. And I'm trying to avoid that, keep it right in the center. And I think 0 0.4 works very well for me. Okay, well, I, I guess those of us that, that, that go for the sort of the, the slightly larger 0 0.6, 0 0.7, it, it may be for other reasons, and that's the next thing we're going to come on to. I mean, we've, we've, we've heard at multiple conferences over the years about the importance of using interposed material like vein grafts and seals. None of us can prove it, but uh, let's just ask the panel, you know, whether they believe that it's worth using a, ce a sealing material either around the piston or between the distal tip of the piston and the perilymph. So what I'm asking you is do you use fat, blood, loose connective tissue, tragal perichondrium or vein? Feel free to answer in, uh, um, in rotation. Well, my approach... My approach is to uh, do a, uh, a small fenestra and then when the prosthesis fits uh, appropriately through a small fenestra, then I use a, a blood seal, as a blood patch as a seal. And I don't think there's any evidence that you need to have a tissue seal or a graft that goes underneath the prosthesis. And so that's what I've used for many, many years and it's worked uh, extremely well. If there's a large uh, uh, stapedotomy, for example, if the posterior third of the foot plate come, came out, then I would think it's appropriate to put some small pieces of tissue around the prosthesis. So you are facilitating a seal, but it doesn't need to go under the prosthesis. Whereas if I have a, a total stapedotomy for, for some reason, um, uh, and or if we're using a torp as uh, Rob Ed demonstrated, then you need a graft under the prosthesis and a, a, a better seal is my approach. And in those cases, I would use either fascia, temp, uh, perichondrium or vein. But I particularly like perichondrium in that, that technique. But for a standard stapedotomy, a blood patch works extremely well and I don't think you need to have anything further. Okay, well we'll ask Ravi and then we'll go to Robert for his comments. Ravi, what, 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 
What's your uh, uh, take on no, this? What do you I, like I to do? I completely, no, I think I completely agree with what Rob just said. I don't use the vein interposition uh, for a regular small fenestra stepidotomy. If the foot plate partly or fully comes out, then I have options of uh, soft tissue, fat, whatever. But uh, on a routine, I don't use interposition. I use a little bit of gel foam, actually. The gel foam tends to help collect that blood in that spot. So a very, very small little dot of gel foam tends to help collect that blood and make that patch. But everything else, what Rob said, I would be completely in agreement with. Well, let's put our let's put our surgeon on the spot, Robert. Um, make some comments about the vein graft. What's your reason? I mean, you've used this in many thousands mm. of patients now, and it obviously works in your hands. I've copied you, and it works in my hands. But there's obviously some disagreement as to whether or not it's required. Interesting to see a British surgeon copying a French surgeon already. It's very interesting to hear. <laughs> well, <that>. yes. <laughs> Nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I think, yeah. well, I understand that in many cases you probably don't need a uh, position that like all these uh, surgeons, Ravi and Rob, they don't use it and they have good, good results. I don't think it changed, it does change the success rate. Uh, but I, I just believe that I want to ensure the, uh, the avoiding the fluid leakage. So I prefer to seal uh, with some tissue and I prefer the vein rather than any other. Uh, prior putting the prosthesis because I, I like to have a, a, a very wide uh, tissue to be sure that I'm uh, sealing the labyrinth. That's the point. Anybody else like to make a comment on that? It, it's an Sergi. interesting question as to whether it Hi. makes a difference to the to the fluid leak. Um, and, and I have worried about that, that it's, it's nice to get a, a secure seal. And that's why I think if you have a bigger opening, it's good to have a tissue seal or, or, or have a graft under the prosthesis. Um, but you know, I've been impressed that even though you've made a stapedotomy and you, if, if you patch it with a blood seal, then I have the patient lie for one hour with that ear upwards, which I presume might facilitate at clotting and, and uh, facilitating a seal. And then the patients go home within, usually within uh, two to three hours of the surgery. Um, so it doesn't seem that they have a, a leakage or a significant vestibular disturbance. Um, so I, I believe it's very well tolerated and that you don't need to have a, a, a vein graft, even though it's a lovely technique. The point Sorry. is that it seems that in my experience, yeah. because, you know, we keep patients for some day here in the clinic because they are going far away from the clinic. So I, I have the chance to be able to follow the patient post-op for a few days. And it's, it's really extremely rare uh, that post-operatively they have any dizziness. It happens, of course, sometimes, but it's very rare. So I believe it's protecting against any uh, reaction of the labyrinth, I don't know, but it's, it's something making a difference. And also remember Rob, that I'm doing a 0 0.8 millimeter stapedotomy, which is uh, smaller than I think what you, when you are doing, like also Seiji said, I do a 0 0.8, which means that with that kind of thing, I need to seal with something. Yeah. Yes, we Bigger. use a, yep. a 0 0.7 yep. with a 0 0.6 prosthesis. So yep. it's, a, it's a snug mm -hmm. fit really. Yeah, that's different, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, Se Seiji's trying to get a word in here from uh, yeah. Japan, Seiji Kankiyaka, yeah. yeah. Hi. So, Robert, so your technique, vein glass technique is really nice, and uh, but uh, I use gel foam plus fibrin glue to seal the hole, so it works fine. Okay, good. Well, I mean, I'll gel come clean with you. I mean, I've... Yeah, well, I've only ever done I, one I with that. I, I can see that many people who are not using Van Graaf and they say, uh, yeah. you have a great experience like uh, Michael also. And I think and you have good results. So I, I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't make a huge difference, but it, uh, as usual, it's a kind of personal technique that you have and you have to keep going on like this. That's the point. They're not only making this it, more complicated. Yeah, it does add 10 minutes to the procedure and makes it slightly more difficult. I mean, in the very early days, I think I did one without a Van Graaf. But it struck me that there were two things that struck me when I was a trainee, and we're going back, you know, 30, 35 years now, is that if I'd done a vein graft, I couldn't inadvertently drop the prosthesis into the vestibule. And you'll say, well, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. But 35 years ago, you know, some of us, when we were first starting, 
weren't quite as good as we are now. And the second thing is if, if you're stuck with doing a malleosed apidotomy, particularly with a relocation, that prosthesis that Robert uses, and I use a very similar one, is a little bit more massive than a Teflon prosthesis with a bit of weight to it. And I do like to have a vein then to stop that disappearing and penetrating too far into the vestibule, which of course raises the next question. Um, Robert and I and Chris cut the prosthesis um, to the to the length of the, the, the distance between the surface of the perilymph and the undersurface of the incus. Um, and the bending side oh, that's can performed I, is to make... Can I just come in a yeah, little bit on. on vein graft at the moment? Yeah. Um, yeah sure. We've got some questions from the Zoom audience. Um, and they're saying, if you use a vein graft, is there a worry over time that it actually flattens out and lifts the prosthesis out of the vestibule? Has the panel's got any thought on that? I, but I guess going to you and Robert, since you use the vein graft. Well, Robert. I can, I can Robert. Uh, reply. I mean, uh, no, I didn't have any problem like this. It, I don't think it does push the prosthesis up. No, I don't think so. Because it's sticking really, even when I revise cases uh, following uh, previous vein graft interposition, uh, I can see that the vein is very nicely stretched over the foot plate, and I didn't see any problem like this before. Okay, I haven't seen and the problems John? either. I suspect the problems are when I didn't get the length of the prosthesis right measuring it. You know, that's a whole different uh, problem is getting the, the length of the prosthesis right. But as you know, Chris, with the vein graft, you, you cut the prosthesis to a very fixed length, the, the, the length between the effectively the surface of the perilymph and, and the incus, whereas a lot of our colleagues who do other techniques will add a little bit to make absolutely sure that it penetrates in through the stapedotomy. So perhaps we could ask the panel... Can we, can we we'll, just, we'll uh, the, just a, the same thing yeah. up on this, John, just before we get on to that? Yep. There's another question here. Before you've got your prosthesis yep, sure. in, you've just done your stapedotomy, and then you've started getting some bleeding. What do the panel do there? So how do you deal with bleeding onto the foot plate when you've made your stapedotomy? That's a question okay, from Michael, the audience. Michael Tong in Hong Kong. You start this one? Yes. Um, well, it's bleeding is always uh, a trouble, I mean, at this stage. Um, so hopefully, um, you prepare your feel much better beforehand. But um, obviously, I, I, I don't use a sucker. And uh, much I use a very small size sucker, uh, and then um, more recently I, I also use uh, some micro patties by the size. So I, I would not use any suction directly now, but just over uh, a piece of micro patties. Um, so I guess, uh, and also the the patties will help to soak out the blood. Um, to that will serve the purpose of a little bit of um, of a purpose. So it's not absolutely dry, the patties. It has to be a little wet. So otherwise, you get a lot of capillary actions and sticky onto it. Do you, do you pop a bit of epinephrine on it, adrenaline on it, or, or not? Uh, I, I use uh, epinephrine. I use adrenaline. Yeah. yeah. OK. Ravi, what would you do? Uh, a couple of things. Once the... Uh the foot plate is opened and you have a fenestra of any size, I would not like to use epinephrine anymore. So I'm kind of concerned about the effect of epinephrine at that particular situation. The other comment I have is that if you don't suck on blood running over the, the fenestra, the blood does not tend to go into the vestibule. It tends to go over the foot plate, over the fenestra, and by surface tension does not enter the vestibule. So it enters the vestibule only when you keep sucking around and then you have a little edge of it leading into the vestibule. So I don't like to suck on it. And I'm very mindful of the fact that if I don't suck so much, uh, less is going to go into the vestibule. And if I have that situation, and I'm sure everybody does at some point of time, I use a piece of gel foam, just plain gel foam, and leave it in place for some time and things tend to settle down. Yes, I think it's John, a way to we've watch got a few see. questions coming through Zoom yeah. on floating foot plate yeah. while we're on the foot plate. Could the yeah. panel address we'll, we'll, that one, please? Yeah, we'll come come to that in about 30 yeah, well, seconds. I, um, yeah, I can say, just I can anybody else want to say any more about already, blood? I already said I already said some uh, some point with that, uh, replying to questions about this point. What I do in that case, I just leave the foot plate intact cover it with a vein graft and just place the prosthesis from the incus to the, to the mobile foot plate. 
and it works fine. There's no risk because then if you try to remove a floating full plate, it makes a uh, high risk about the, to, 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 to see the, the, the full plate going down into the labyrinth. And I must say that in that case, you close completely the airborne gap. The only problem is that there's a risk of refixation of the stapes full plate, but in that case, then you can perform, you can go back and perform a safe state colony. So I would advise to leave the floating full plate and cover it with a vein or any other tissue. Okay, does anybody else have any, uh, have any views on that? Anybody do a drill out at the side and then hook the foot plate out or do you all tend to leave it? Ravi? Uh, I, I've stopped doing that drill out on the promontory and trying to hook that thing out. My only comment in addition to what Robert just said is that sometimes if the foot plate just goes down, you're all right. But sometimes the foot plate tends to turn and go down. And in that case, putting a piston and trying to uh, cover it is not probably a good idea. So more often than not, if I have a floater and I'm not certain of being able to extract it, I will leave it alone and come back later. I will not try to put something on top of it. Right. Well, I think we should throw it open to the Zoom room now. They should have quite a lot of results from the polls that were provided, which, which should give the basis for ongoing questions yeah. for the next 45 okay. minutes. Okay. Uh, John, we've got quite a bit of questions coming in. Um, we have one question about those people who use gel foam as a seal around the foot plate. Is there any worry that that will cause delayed sensory neural hearing loss? I don't know if the panel, those that use gel foam, have got any thoughts on that? Uh, I use gel foam and I mentioned that. No, I've never had problems in, with long-term sensory neural loss or short-term. But remember, I use gel foam when I have a small fenestra and I have a snug fitting piston. And I tend not to use gel foam when I have a larger fenestra or one portion of the foot plate comes out. But to answer your question, no. Using gel foam on the, on the foot plate, on the fenestra does not cause any problems. And Sage, yeah, I think I you use gel foam as well, yes? Yeah. Yes, uh, I uh, follow the patient I, more than three, three years, but uh, I don't see any sensory neural healing loss. So I don't think a gel foam causes sensory neural healing loss. Thank you very much. And there's been an, another few questions about mm. people who use speculum holders, particularly if anyone does their surgery under local and uses a speculum holder. What's the nature of the speculum holder? I think that might be one for you, perhaps, Rob. Do you use a spectrum holder? I do. Um, I think it's a version of the Shea speculum holder. Um, and I found it very, very uh, acceptable for the patients under local and sedation. But I, I start with uh, 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 the, the anaesthetist initially gives a, a, an intravenous bolus of some midazolam, um, propofol and uh, fentanyl. So they're basically asleep for a few minutes. And at that time I do an injection uh, in the post auricular sulcus and in the uh, uh, end oral region. And then um, we then prep and drape the patient. And by the time they're prepped and draped, often they're, they've woken up a little bit. And then I commence with a handheld uh, speculum and further infiltration in four quadrants and then I raise the and then I raise the uh, make the incisions and elevate the flap to the level of the annulus, and then I place a uh, an adrenaline-soaked piece of cotton wool, uh, whilst I change to a larger size speculum, and then I fix it with the speculum holder. So and is that, that speculum stage, holder fixed to the table? To, or to, to the, the table. So it's quite rigid. It's quite rigid, yeah. and that uh, I think helps to keep some pressure with the speculum and, um, and, and then after that, I've got two hands to uh, do the uh, elevation of the flap and uh, the bone curatage and complete the procedure. And I've found that technique works very well. That's great. Um, I don't know, uh, John, there's been, there's been some questions about the, I, I don't know if it's worth reiterating, the size of diameter of the piston that the panel all use. Well, so if you just, just remind the, the delegates, yeah. I know you, you touched on it before, the size of the hole and the size of the piston you use, Rob. So the, the piston is 0.6 millimetres diameter 
and I like to use a nitinol fluoroplastic uh, piston, so it's the self-crimping uh, type. And I currently use the Grace Medical Eclipse one, which I found gives the nicest 360 degree uh, closure around the Incus Long process. And the Fenestra is 0.7 millimeters, so technically slightly larger, obviously, than the piston itself. But pretty snug, so 0 0.1 difference. I ideally, it's pretty snug, correct. Yeah. Okay, John, do you want to Yeah, John, there's two questions here from the, from the Indian uh, uh, delegates. Can I put them forward? Go ahead, Minish, go ahead. Yes. Uh, one uh, question which is asked by a lot of people here, not only in this and also the previous webinars you've had from India, is for, for you and everyone in the panel, how important is a CT scan in stapes surgery as of today? Uh, is it only for medical legal purposes or is it something more than that which you all really advise? Right. Well, I'll start off with that one because I'm the offender who, who for primary suspected uncomplicated stapes surgery, I don't perform a scan, but you know, gradual pressure has been brought on me by Chris and Ian, who you can see in the audience, uh, that medically legally it's beginning to become very important, um, UK in North America, because even though you may believe it's uncomplicated uh, otosclerosis, there may well be problems in there like a deficient facial nerve that you need to discuss with the patient prior to starting. So it is now my policy that I have started to ask for CT scans in primary surgery. For revision, I would always ask for a CT scan. What about the other panelists? Could you put the question forth to them as well? Yeah, I have the yeah, same problem as well. It's a, a medical legal issue, so we have to do it. I don't believe it's very important for a primary in most of the cases, but now we have to do it, so uh, it's clear. Sure. I'm Does anyone have to any other opinion? That. Yes. Yes, I don't think it's necessary. If you have a clear-cut uh, clinical diagnosis, family history, bilateral, um, when things are straightforward, I don't think there's a need to do a CT scan. And you will I'd find conditions such as the hissant nerve. And uh, you should have informed the patient in advance about uh, the, you know, what you will do in certain circumstances. Um, Whereas though you're not sure about the diagnosis or it's unilateral disease or there's no family history or it's been long standing, you're not sure of the, the onset, then I think a CT is a very good idea. Um, but where it's straightforward, I don't believe that it's a necessary, but there's no harm if you've got access, I guess. Rafi? And, uh, there's a, yes. Hello, yeah. No, I think I agree. I mean, for an uncomplicated primary surgery in a case of bilateral otosclerosis, I don't think I need one. But uh, congenital ears, children, unilateral loss, uh, not so certain tuning fork tests, revision surgery, I would do it. I have a CBCT in the next room where I sit and it's 10 minutes and I have it available anyway. So I think medical legally as well, I think it's good that we start doing it. That's right. And uh, there's a question here is what do you think for a STP surgery in a profound hearing loss, uh, which is an advanced autosclerosis? When do you advise a patient to do a STP surgery and when would you think of a cochlear implant? Uh, Manesh? Manesh? Yes. Yes. Can you just, just come back for the CT scan? I would love to, to know sure. about what they do in Japan and in Hong Kong in terms of medical legal no. points. That would be interesting to know that. And maybe Dwayne can say about what's going on also in, in South Africa. Sure. Yes. So, Seiji? in Japan, hi, hi, Robert. So, in Japan, I always uh, do a CT scan, pre surgical, as a pre surgical procedure. So, because we don't know, uh, we'd like to rule out other malformation or other pathologies rather than otosclerosis. So in my opinion, I need a CT scan pre-surgically. Mm. Most of my patients come in with a scan already. So if they don't come in with a scan, I, I do a CBCT. So um, I think I just find, find out a lot um, more 
things that the radiologists and I myself can read from the CBCT now. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that um, for experienced surgeons, um, they can do anything along on the line or they can tackle any situation. But, um, but if you prepare well with uh, preoperative imaging, it's always better. So, so it's becoming almost like a standard for people with conductive hearing loss to have a CT scan. And, and even before coming to see me, they would bring a pile of scans to see me, which is re not really necessary. But a CBCT, I, I, I do recommend. So maybe from the South African perspective, Rob, we had a, um, a situation where we did 200 uh, cases where we did CT scan everyone before we did a stapes. And I have to say, it did not change our management of any of those patients. There wasn't anything that stood out. I have to agree with Ravi and Rob on the case that we would initially not do a CT scan, but in single-sided deafness or single-sided oversclerosis or conductive loss, we definitely would consider it. And uh, Yes, there's all that little semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome that we are seeing more in the older patients. So obviously an atypical later onset, we would definitely do a CT scan. So that's, uh, I have a CB, CBCT right next door to me like Robbie does. And uh, our problem in South Africa is in the private sector, patients often have to pay for this. It's not cheap, but um, that might be a factor as well. That, that's the South African yeah. view. Thank you. Manesh, please uh, I've, keep I've, going. I, I've missed, I've missed um, two third window syndromes in my career, which I suppose if I'd had a scan, I would have picked up. I've gone and operated. I've thought, mm, I'm not sure whether this foot plate's fixed or not. In both cases, I went on and put a piston in with a vein graft and the hearing didn't improve. And in both cases, they turned out to have a third window. So I, that, I suppose that is a good reason for, for doing a scan. Minish, oh, carry John, on. you do a you do a stapedotomy on a mobile footplate, then, do you? In these cases, um, <laughs> I, no, I didn't. I didn't say that. I said I couldn't make my mind up whether it was fixed or not. You know well, that there are those well, situations. It, it, it may where be you palpate. Uh, dual pathology. Yeah, yeah, may well be, may well be. But I didn't <clears> have the scan, so it wasn't until afterwards, when there wasn't a significant change in the uh, the audiogram, that the scan got performed, and it revealed. Uh, uh, the third window, I think Chris advised me on one of them. It's about, about four years ago. Um, and the other one but was I, a little bit further back. I, I think, I think, I think, it's I think the other thing here that's uh, interesting is that we get a lot of experienced surgeons here on the panel who see revision cases. And some of these cases are, I opened the ear and the facial, uh, the oval window niche was very small or there was dehiscent facial nerve and I was unable to perform the surgery. And I think for, for surgeons starting off, if you do a CT scan, you can filter out those cases and you can refer them elsewhere. So if you're doing your first stapes, it's very nice to have a CT scan to know that it's not um, uh, an obliterative window, that the facial nerve's not dehiscent, that the niche is normal. So for you know experienced surgeons who've done thousands of cases and can deal with anything that comes their way, you really probably don't need a CT scan. But I think when you start off, it's a very good way of picking the nice cases and sending the tricky ones to someone else. Yeah, Chris, it, you it, mentioned it, it is the number, number of cases. A small anterior focus. What John yeah. said, Chris, I understand you what, what, what John wants to speak about. I, I also had some experience like this when you open up the middle ear and you have a, you are not absolutely sure that the foot plate is fixed. And I, by experience, when if we keep going on and do state of in this case, usually the results are not so good and we cannot really clear, uh, 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 close the abon gap in a nice way. So I would advise for any surgeon who is facing uh, a case like this where he's not sure about the status fixation, just stop the surgery. That by experience with the one we have, that's something that we have to do to, to say to the people. So that's what my point. So can I just ask the, uh, can I ask the Zoom audience via, via Minish, um, via the polling that you've just done, how many yes. stapes operations are people performing? I did such well, a it's it's, uh, it's 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 a sixty-three percent of them are watching this program are actually doing CP surgery, and uh, you have a good amount of people, about forty-one percent in the age group of thirty-five to fifty, who are seeing this. So you have a lot of experienced surgeons who are actually watching us here. Yeah, there should but, be numbers. How as many well. cases there should be a poll there for numbers. Year. Sorry, I, I didn't hear you. The two of them speaking. In in in, in the poll. In one of the yes. polls there, one of the polling questions, it says, do you do less than 10, 10 to 25, 25 to 50, 
more than 50 over 100 it, it might be worth just asking that question it would yeah, be really interesting so, to find out yes so the uh, uh, the, the poll question was uh, not related to the stapy surgery to get an idea of the audience and uh, that was i think the yeah. the uh, uh, between 35 to 50 was the main uh, uh, audience uh, majority yeah if you, so, if you, if you group, keep yes. on asking if you keep on going through the questions, poll a couple more times, there are about yes. eight questions there. So we can find that out while we're having a discussion about uh, other questions. Yes, yes. coming back just, to an I'm interesting question. Yes, coming okay, back to one you. interesting question that was asked, that if you have a patient of advanced autosclerosis, and this is to uh, all the panelists, and each one can answer if he has a different view, we are most welcome. Uh, in advanced autosclerosis, when would we actually think of not doing a STP surgery uh, and go for a cochlear implant, or would you like to do a stepidotomy and then give a patient a trial of a hearing aid? Uh, uh, how do you go about doing it? What is the criteria which you all decide? Maybe we can start from Dr. Robert and he can guide us through. You're mu you muted, Robert. Uh, you're muted, you're muted. Can I say it again? I didn't uh, exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay, the question is in advanced autosclerosis, yeah. when, okay. when would you actually think of doing a stepidotomy to close the airborne gap? And when would you think that the patient would, you would refer for a cochlear implant? I think it's always important to try to do it. Even if we, we have a far advanced autosclerosis, it's always better because first of all, you never know exactly what is the pre-operative level of bone connection. We also have some case of overclosure. And the second thing is that sometimes you can improve, even if it's a small improvement, then you can improve a little bit the hearing and then you can give the possibility to go for hearing aid. So each time we can do state regular state surgery, I think it's always better to start by the state surgery. And if necessary, if it doesn't work, then we have the cochlear implant a second, at a second point as a backup. Yes. Would anyone else in the panel like to? Yes. Would Would anyone else yeah. in the panel I, uh, like to uh, add or comment on it further? I definitely, I definitely comment on that because I've had a patient recently who was scoring thirty percent uh, on her speech discrimination, had been listed for cochlear implantation, and had. Um, mm. 70 db thresholds and we had a long discussion at one of the medical conferences i think it was at the cost clinic meeting last year about whether or not i should intervene with stapy surgery first i did i've done both sides and she's now getting scores up in the 80s and is not using her hearing aid most of the time she's still going to get end stage cochlear otosclerosis one day and will or, and may need um cochlear implantation but we may have staved that off for one two three decades so i think it's always worth considering doing a stapes before moving on to cochlear implantation john i largely agree with you but there are some cases that uh despite a, a successful stapedectomy uh, you don't and and closure of any airbone gap that their speech discrimination does not improve adequately. Yeah. And I think we can yeah. predict this in some of the cases that have uh, uh, far advanced otosclerosis. If there is no bone conduction uh, thresholds in the higher frequencies, and the pattern is very clearly of a sloping centrineural loss with, with uh, uh, profound or absent bone conduction in the high in the high sorry rob somebody's got a microphone yeah. open when the washing up's being done if they could just close their microphone carry on rob carry so for, for those where you've got detectable bone conduction in the higher frequencies then you should always try the stapedectomy first but there is there is a, a group with in the far advanced otosclerotics who who don't have any bone conduction thresholds in the higher frequencies and so closing that gap they'll still have a, uh, a a sloping profound loss which is severe to profound and their speech discrimination uh, is perhaps not likely to improve enough to be worthwhile and some of those are better to go straight for for cochlear implant but i have to say it's rare and i would almost always recommend doing a stapedectomy first then re-measuring their uh, speech perception and some of them haven't improved enough and you can go to relatively early cochlear implantation. Does anybody People else on the panel want to come in on that one? Yeah. Ravi. 
Yes, yeah, so the the situation in India is a little different. We don't have uh, funding for adult uh, uh, patients for cochlear implants, and that changes uh, things dramatically. So if you don't have funding, they're not going to have a cochlear implant. So you can rule out implantation for the vast majority of that patient list. So you would tend to uh, trial with a stepidectomy and maybe a hearing aid before or after that, and that's all they get. Okay. What about in the Far East? What about uh, Hong Kong and uh, Japan? We, we all um, do a CB test, of course, and because um, they, they, there is a hearing aid trial period for these patients anyway. So um, some patients actually uh, opt not to have stabidectomy. For they, they are the more severe case. So, um, but majority of people will have a stabidectomy um, okay. before the surgery. But we, we, we counsel the patient, discuss with them, saying that uh, even if they are on the sort of light worse edge, uh, sometimes it can get um, mm -hmm. uh, improvement in the conduction, some overclosure as well. So, um, so it all depends on the cases. But um, I can see Seiji, so Seiji nodding his head there. Yeah. Yeah. You agree, Seiji? I agree with okay. Michael. Yeah. So perhaps Meenish and Chris, perhaps you could share the results of that poll with us, just to give us uh, an idea. Talk us through it. Yeah. yeah, the uh, the results of the poll of how many surgery uh, of stapes was done, uh, honestly, so you had about 59% who did about uh, 10 under 10 number of cases. 27% uh, of our audience have done from 10 to 25 cases a year. And uh, and then you have uh, uh, about three percent who have done uh, uh, less. So so the majority of them have done uh, more than fifty eight percent have do under ten. And uh, the okay. other uh, poly question was: uh, Would you do a stepidectomy or a stepidotomy? Uh, we have an eighty eight percent of the audience who have are doing a stepidotomy. But interestingly, we still have fifteen percent who still do stepidectomy as of today. Okay, well, that, those are quite interesting figures. Um, and let's just put the cat among the pigeons. Um, we're really in a situation now, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe Chris or Ian, we're in the UK. We like to see a surgeon performing at least 10 to 12 minimum operations per year if they're going to continue doing stapy surgery, and, and preferably a few more than that. But very few of us, you know, very few surgeons, particularly in the UK, would perform uh, more than 30 to 50 a year. You could count them on one hand. So, what do the what do the panel what what do the panel feel is the feeling in their particular countries about how many stapes operations you need to perform to maintain your skills? Let's start with Seiji in Japan. Maybe how many cases? Uh, and maybe at least once a month, once a month. You know, as you know, in Japanese population, we don't have as much patients as you have in European country. So we Japanese don't have a chance to perform a stable surgery as much. Okay. Well, of course, if you're performing a lot of middle ear surgery for other reasons and acicular work, you are going to develop those skills. What's the situation in Hong Kong, Michael? Yes, um, we, we don't have a high prevalence of um, autosclerosis, so we don't use autosclerosis as an index. Uh, the same as IG, we, we pull together oxycos and, um, and stapes procedures, so um, not every surgeon would do it, and actually not every single autologist will do uh, both of these procedures. So I think, say, about 50 a year would be the right number. Uh, at least you, you have to do about 50 obstacles and stay piece a year. Yeah. Yeah, combined. But to the Zoom audience, yep. do, do Meenish and uh, Chris and Ian want to comment on that? <clears throat> Um, I think we've had the comment a lot in the UK about uh, how many you do. It seems that it depends really what you do for the rest of your week. So a bit like uh, Michael was saying in Hong Kong, if you're doing a lot of vesicular surgery and stapes surgery, 
then you can probably get away with fewer numbers. But if you're mainly doing parotids and laryngectomies, then, you know, five stapes a year is not going to cut it anymore. And I don't think that would stand up in court. But if you're an ear surgeon and you're taking cleistotoma off the stapes foot plate day in, day out, then probably doing uh, one a month is probably reasonable. But there is a tendency for people, even within otology in the UK, to subspecialize and send their stapelectomies elsewhere. That's often driven by a bad result. You know, a patient gets a dead ear, maybe gets sued, decides they don't want to do it anymore. So there's a sort of medical legal drive to wanting to do more. I would I agree with that. I would agree with that. Yeah. I think I think you've got if you're a practicing otologist, then your skill set allows you to do a yeah. relatively low number of stapy surgeries. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I've got an axe to grind here, having written a paper on the learning curve and, you know, two experienced otologists, myself and Matthew Young, took 100 cases before we started getting really good at it. And both of us had failures in the first um, 10 or 15 cases. So I, I, we then, I suppose, ought to talk about how you train trainees. I mean, do you believe that somebody that's somebody going to start doing safety surgery should do um, some form of fellowship or should work with an experienced stapy surgeon first before they start doing stapy surgery? Ravi? Do you believe a trainee should come to you first before they set up and say, I'm going to do stapy surgery down the road at another hospital? Uh, I think that they should have sufficient uh, number of uh, middle year procedures. I think like you already emphasized, the, uh, they are more in number and you tend to get more experience, more control of your fingers when you are peeling a colchitoma off the foot plate or doing osteoplasty. I think that's probably a good way to start, get sufficient numbers of colchitoma and osteoplasties under your belt and then slowly go on to stapy surgery. I don't think stapy surgery should be done in a hurry, not early in your career, simply because one dead year and then you're like, you know, demoralized and it's not a good situation. It's not good for you, not okay. good for the patient. Anybody else have a view on that? So let's, uh, if nobody's got a view on John, that, let's, John, let's we, talk about... John, we yeah. have a, talking about trainees, uh, we have a question yes. from Mike Waring. So those are, right. I know some of you don't have Is he a trainee? Is he, well, is, is he that British trainee? Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah. for those of you who have trainees, you're sitting there, you're asking your trainee to do the surgery. They've lifted up the flap. They dislocate the incuspedial joint. And at the same time, they manage to dislocate the incus. So the incus is now hypermobile. What do you do at that point? In That's my Mike's case, question. If, if I found a hypermobile uh, incus, I would remove the incus and put a manage to, and, and do a manage to stay yeah. me procedure. <clears throat> okay. Any other okay. thoughts on that? I agree. If it is truly uh, hypermobile and subluxed, I would remove the incus and do a, a malleus to vestibule uh, prosthesis. I don't. I don't do a, uh, a malleus reposition as as Robert nicely showed i would use again the uh a nitinol fluoroplastic piston for example the one made by gyrus which is uh, i found works very nicely around the handle of the malleus to the foot plate usually around six millimeters and uh i've got uh, nice outcomes in terms of closure the gap with that that uh, technique Ravi. Chris, can we go back to the yeah, to sometime to manage with the uh with the uh, pool and all this stuff with the uh, Zoom uh, conference? Sure, let's... Uh, this was just from the pool. Uh, that was one of the Zoom questions, Robert. I don't know yeah. if there's any more. Uh, Manish, are you uh, there? Yeah, we had a few questions here, yeah. yeah. Uh, one is, of course, uh, to everybody, what is the age of CP surgery which you can actually think of? I mean, do you, is there an age limit? Uh, so the question has two parts. One is, is there an age limit when you would decide to do a stapy surgery? And would an audiometry or a pure tone audiometry actually, in terms of hearing loss, decide the extent of disease? 
So you have uh, the amount of hearing loss on the audiometry. Does it also uh, uh, give you an indication of any obliteration or the extents of disease? And also have uh, you uh, age limit when you would decide to do a surgery or wait to do a surgery uh, if you have a child? So I can start replying with this, and then we can go to the panel if, if, if it's fine with you. Uh, I, 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 um, it, it, my experience, I didn't find really clear correlation between the importance of the abon gap and the uh, importance of severity of fixation of the stapes. Sometimes we have a, a case of obliterative foot plate with a really strongly fixed foot uh, stapes, and the abon gap is not that much. And on the other side, we sometimes have a really large abon gap, and with a normal situation, with a fixed foot plate, but not that much. I mean, a regular one. So I don't see any correlation. It's very interesting. And the minimum age, uh, it's a case-by-case -case discussion in terms of uh, state surgery on a young child. Very strictly case-by-case, -case, depending on the, uh, the situation with a hearing aid or not, and things like that. It's always better to wait until the patient can decide by himself, but sometimes you have to do it. So my... Um, a lower age was uh, eight, and it's also the case for congenital, eight-year-old minimum. Yes. Anyone else in the panel? I, Could you have another opinion? I'd, or I'd, abso out? I'd absolutely, I'd absolutely agree with that, and it depends on the child as well. Um, mm. I mean, we have an age of consent. The last thing you want is to go and operate on a child where the parents have wanted it, and the child gets to the age of eighteen and says, "You know, why did you let this guy?" in the UK operate on my ear and cause a problem. You didn't let me be part of the decision-making process. So sometimes you'll get a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old who's got a problem who's highly intelligent and understands the concept of risk. And I think in that situation, it's fair to do something. But if you have a child who perhaps doesn't really get an idea of what's going on, I think you need to wait until they're a little bit older if you can possibly manage with hearing aids. So I'd wait where I can until the child is a little bit older. Yes, and uh, the, the other part of the question, do you also think an audiometry uh, airborne gap has a huge value in knowing the extent of disease or not really? No, not really. I, I, sometimes you open the ear with a maximal gap and you, you can't even convince yourself there's a very convincing focus. And other times you'll have really? a small gap and you know, there's a big focus. It, it, it doesn't, I don't think there's any correlation. Yes. Is it the same in, in Hong Kong and Japan as well? <clears throat> we yeah. don't see patients coming with very small airborne gaps who request surgeries. So, and we don't we don't request the patients to be operated on. Um, and so what I, about I children? We, we Do you see operate in age group children? Um, I we we operate on children when they reach their age. Um, for consent, so we we don't really go for. I mean, except for those cases which um, we will discuss. These are congenital stay piece cases, and what we are going mm -hmm. to do. So um, I don't particularly fond of um, um, do, doing this abnorm abnormal stay piece um, at a very young age. Yeah. Yeah, and is it the same in Japan? The Japanese are very hardworking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm waiting for the kids become old, like uh, over 12 years old. Uh, as uh, as John said, uh, if he is very intelligent, we can perform uh, stapedotomy even in the younger age. But, so, uh, so what we're trying to say here uh, is you wait till the chi child can give his or her own consent uh, before you actually operate the child, is that what you're trying to understand as a as a protocol well, in, in there? Well, I, I I think we're saying till the child can be part of the decision making process, they can't legally give their consent. Um, Correct. Till they're a certain age, but they can be part of the decision making process. And you know that mm. there are twelve year olds who can make an intelligent decision, and there are fifty five year olds who can't. Um, you know, you have to play <laughs> yeah, it. But you have to play it by ear with every with every patient. But if you've got two parents and a child who've sat down together, you've spent three quarters of an hour with them. The child understands what's going on quite often better than the parents. Um, That's right. Then it may be very reasonable to proceed. But this is where That's you right. know experience comes in, and this is why you should be doing reasonably large numbers. 
That's right. What what is it in Chennai, Ravi? Do you follow the same protocol here with the child? Yeah, I mean, uh, the the in Chennai in India, I think the the point is not so much about uh, informed consent from the child. I think it's more for me the incidence of uh, otitis media with effusion and the chance of infection. So normally not under the age of 12, but after the age of 12 in that rare patient who needs surgery, typically a congenital conductive deafness, those are patients I would do it. It's not the issue of consent in India as yet. Dead. And is Dwayne there? Dwayne, can we have an yes. opinion from South Africa as well? What What so, is the age we think of? I, I must be honest, we haven't done in very, very young patients. Our youngest was, I think, 11 years old. So um, we have done congenital ears, which is a little bit different. But in this situation, I would be very careful. And we've the legal opinion in South Africa is getting quite strict. And so I think I have to go with what John says. Let the patient help make the decision. In our current legal system, 12 years old, the child can actually help or will make that decision and uh, the parents can then concur. And uh, that's what we would see in South Africa at this stage. Um, I just want to make a comment though, and um, sorry, I'm, I know it's a little bit off the point, but uh, Mike Waring asked that question about the dislocated incus when you mobilizing it. And uh, Mike, I know I've already answered you on the question, but uh, uh, we've used, I've only seen this twice and it's happened to me, so I'm guilty as well. I used a little bit of acicular cement and just stuck the uh, incus back to the malleus and uh, managed in those two cases to get very nice results and we haven't yet had a problem, but that's only two cases. Right. Just right. We've, got about four, we've got about four minutes left. So just a final one that was in one of the polls, whether we've got to that, I don't know. If we could yes. just go we around the panel. The... Yeah, you've, okay. you've done the operation. Your patient wants to fly. Can he and when? One week, one month, three months, six months, one year, never. <laughs> one answer from each of you. Less than one Ravi. week. Less than they one week. They can fly in less week. than one week. Okay. Michael. Uh, I check them one week. If they don't have any other problem, I let them fly. Up. Okay. Seiji? One when month. do you let them fly? Agreed. Same as me. Okay. Jo uh, Robert. Well, they cannot fly anymore, so that's not a problem for the moment, but it's uh, one month. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what about scuba diving, Robert? <laughs> uh, then I always try to convince that it's not really good to go back to scuba diving, but if they want to do it, I just ask for one, one year. Okay, and Rob Briggs, I mean, but, pretty but, important but, but, where wait, you I are. Have... I had cases. I had cases where the prof they were professional guys. They had to come back, so and I. they all did well after one year. So I didn't. I didn't have any problem with that. But it's always a, there's no a, a scientific evidence about that. But we're all afraid about having a problem uh, deep deep in, in in the in the sea. Okay, and finally, Rob Riggs. Yeah, I, I mean, you're in a very sur I, I surfing culture. What do you think? But they have well, I tell, I tell they have them two weeks. Two, they have two weeks for flying. Although I've had patients uh, fly in and then fly out again within 48 hours. So, um, been okay. uh, but that makes me nervous. Um, for scuba diving, I tell them that it's contraindicated and that snorkeling is very good. Um, but if they really want to scuba dive, scuba dive, then I really emphasize that they've got to be able to equalize without any discomfort or, or, or difficulty. Otherwise, it's dangerous. Um, my only other concern is after a torp, um, then that uh, I'm, I'm a bit more concerned. And so I, I emphasize yeah. to those patients to be very cautious about uh, flying if you can't equalize pressure easily. So um, they, they're the precautions that I would recommend. Rob, it's okay, well, thanks, thanks very much. To, 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 do, to, to do scuba diving in Australia with all the sharks that yeah, you have. The sharks. <laughs> So we need a, we need a quick dolphins, summary. We've got, one minute, we, we've got one minute left, everybody. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble from uh, Mission Control in Utrecht. Maybe uh, I'll just summarize what I believe are some of the points that have been made. Um, it doesn't really matter whether you do a trans-canal approach or whether you do an end oral slit. Uh, what's important is getting a good visual access of the operating field and controlling any blood that's dripping down. The tip of the speculum will do that with transcanal, and your bipolar will do it if you've got an endoral slit or maybe a little bit of retraction. 
um, a good reflection fluid of the tympanic membrane, trying to avoid damaging the corda. If necessary, open the corda canal so that you've got a good view. Robert um, would say you should be able to see the pyramid and the facial nerve. I would agree with that. I'm sure the rest of the panelists would. And we don't like to uncover too much of the long process of the incus with our resection. Uh, then a good view of the stapes superstructure, vital to separate the joint to assess mobility before you proceed any further. Remove the superstructure as you wish, preferably with a micro drill or a laser, but there are other ways of doing it. A stapedotomy varying between 0.4 and 0.8 millimeters, depending on your technique. And we haven't come to a conclusion on interposed material or a seal. We all have our own techniques. We all get good results. It probably doesn't make any difference. What's important is you are fastidious. You do it carefully and you do lots of surgeries to keep your manual skills up. Hopefully that summarizes everything. Thank you very much for this panel. We'll be going on now after the company presentation, which we'll, come, we'll make to a secular plastic and see you again then. Thank you, Meanish, Ian, and Chris in the Zoom room. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, John. For Welcome well, to the cheers. Luminous presentation. My name is Simon Smith, and the Europe, Middle East, and Africa thank brand manager for the Head and Neck division. I'm going to be taking 10 minutes of your time this morning to take you through our company and our CO2 solutions, including the Otterlays, which you've seen in action in this morning's case. So I'll start by talking to you about who Luminous are as a company and the system that was used in the case this morning. And following that, I'll walk you through the system components, the technologies we have before finally moving on to the otology specific solution that we have in the Otterlays. So who are Luminous as a company? Luminous are the world's largest medical laser company. We are a global developer, manufacturer and distributor of laser and light based devices for surgical, aesthetic and ophthalmic applications. We have over 900 employees as a company and a global distribution network that operates across our various business, surgical and aesthetic units. We have 265 patents and have 260 plus FDA clearances with a global install base of 80,000 plus. In addition, we have a presence in over 80 countries across the world. So let's start by talking about the CO2 laser system that was used in today's surgery. The system itself has two main modes of operation, utilizing free beam and fiber based technologies. In the free beam, the energy is delivered through the articulated arm in conjunction with the operating microscope or the handpieces. When using the operating microscope, there's a choice of three AccuSpot micro manipulators, and that depends on the model of operating microscope that you're using in surgery. The SurgiTouch scanner is used in conjunction with the digital AccuBlade or the DAB, a semi-robotic linear cutting within the larynx or the airway. The CO2 fiber based technology provides the precision of the CO2 laser energy but overcomes the line of sight problem when using a surgical operating microscope and I'll come on to a little bit more about that shortly. The fiber lays can be used deeper within the airway and easily within the oral cavity. The otter lays is used specifically for otology surgery. The AccuPulse Duo itself has application uses in otolaryngology, MaxFax, plastics, gynecology, and also thoracics. It's an upgradable platform. For example, it can be used in aesthetic applications. As you can see from the bottom of the screen, we have a wide range of CO2 laser accessories. So let's focus on the SurgiTouch scanner and the digital AccuBlade. The SurgiTouch provides, produces shapes from the energy which is provided by the AccuPulse Duo. And it can be used with hand pieces to produce circles for ablation. It can also be used with the AccuSpot with the digital AccuBlade, the DAB. It produces lines or curves for cutting. The scanning micro manipulator is able to produce unprecedented precision and reprodu reproducible results for the surgeon. 
So when the surgical objective is to treat the pathology with the maximum possible control, while minimizing adjacent healthy tissue damage, and also preserving organ functionality, the DAB micromanipulator is an indispensable tool to precisely incise, excise, or ablate the tissue. What does that mean for the patient? It actually reduces the risk of complications and increases the patient's quality of life. An example at the bottom of the screen there is the different modes. For example, cir circular ablation, linear and curved incisions, and also ablation. Let's focus a little on the depth of penetration. So the CO2 laser has the smallest zone of thermal spread in comparison with all other energy-based devices. So in theory, the depth of tissue penetration for the CO2 is only 0.1 millimeters. But for a surgeon, that means unprecedented precision and the ability to operate near really critical structures and delicate anatomy, such as those in autology cases. So let's summarize the digital AccuBlade, but it's virtually char-free laser delivery, which ensures clean excisional margins, has reproducible tissue effect. The system has preset parameters customized to the treated tissue and patient's anatomy. As mentioned before, the system is compatible with all the leading surgical microscopes. It also gives the surgeon maximum control as his incision shape, length and depth and orientation are easily adjusted by the surgeon. The surgery touch scanning movement may reduce the procedure time when compared with conventional CO2 laser microsurgery. And finally, minimal heat buildup in tissue equates to accelerated healing time. So for the patient, fewer post-operative complications. So I mentioned before that I would el elaborate further on the line of sight problem. So with the traditional CO2 laser microsurgery setup, the laser can really only be fired in a straight line and usually that's around 400 millimeters. So if the targeted tissue is not in the line of sight of the operating microscope, it's gonna be impossible to treat that with the CO2 laser. For example, in the lower airway tract or the pharynx. For that reason, Luminous launched the fiber-based technologies for the CO2 a few years ago. For example, the fiber lays. This can be used either through the dedicated hand pieces or through the working channel of an existing flexible scope with the endoscopic protection sheath, such as the bronchoscope or the transnasal esophageal scope. The fiber lays comes in two options, the single use or the multi-use fiber, which is called the Endure. The Otolase is a fiber delivery system to perform ear surgery cases, such as a stapedectomy, cholesteatoma, and also adhesions. Finally, in the bottom right of the screen, we see the dropping guide, which enables the fiber lays to be used with the Da Vinci robot. So let's move on to the Otolase. So we know that the goal for middle ear surgery is the restoration of sound conduction in the middle ear. What are some of the risks associated with middle ear surgery? Excessive sounds, vibrations or heat during the surgery can cause temporary or permanent adverse conditions. For example, facial nerve damage, hearing loss, tinnitus, vertigo or nausea. With the Otolase, we have three different system components. We have the fiber, which can be used up to 24 times. We have two reusable handpiece options and two single-use tip options. In addition, we have an improved fiber drape. So moving back to the handpieces, they're ergonomically designed, they're thin, they include a grasping mechanism, they're easy to maneuver and hold, and will facilitate clear sight visualization for the surgeon. There's a, a selection of two single use tips, which are either straight or they're curved. Both of these options are highly durable and facilitate reliable energy transmission. So the total working distance would be the combined length of the handpiece, the shaft and the tip, which will allow adequate operation with the selected microscope. 
So on the left of the screen is an example of a complete starter kit, which includes a box of 12 curved tips, 12 straight tips, a straight handpiece, curved handpiece, which is a complete starter kit. So here's an example of the complete assembly of the Ottolay's kit. So firstly, we have the fibre, which is the piece that connects into the system, which is either the Acupulse Duo or the Ultrapulse Duo. Covering that fibre, we have the sterile drape. And the fibre is connected to the handpiece, either the straight or the curved handpiece. Finally, to complete the assembly, the tips are connected, the straight or the curved tips are connected to the handpiece. So what are some of the clinical benefits overall of the Ottolase system? Well, the Ottolase supports delivery of an efficient procedure, therefore enhancing safe middle ear surgery. We have precise and controlled layer by layer removal of the diseased tissue. And for the patient, there's less chance of vestibular injury. Overall, the non-contact non nature of the system well, minimizes can, the can possibility for any inadvertent trauma to the adjacent structures. So thank you for watching the Luminous presentation. Please go to www.lionweb.org and search for the Luminous booth where you'll be able to click on the screens to register your interest in any of the Luminous products that you've seen here or indeed to receive further information on any of our products overall. Thank you. Yeah.